Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> and we'll stand together for the reading of God's word. I hope by now you figured it out. God will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Let's read this. Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. <clears throat> uh, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. I pray that you would bless it to our hearts and help us to learn and grow. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. There's a tremendous blessing in Abraham's covenant for people besides Israel. There's a blessing for me today. I will bless them that bless thee. If I'm a blessing to the Jews... Uh, God said he will bless me. Now, just understand this. Just because they're God's chosen people doesn't make them godly, doesn't make them right. But just because they're not godly and right doesn't mean they're not God's chosen people. And so this is important to understand. Israel today, it's a wicked nation just like every other nation. But that doesn't change the fact that God is dealing with them and will continue to deal with them. And so that, this is so important to understand. We've been studying this for a number of weeks because if you do not understand what God says about Israel, you, you really miss a lot about Jesus Christ because uh, you look how, and you miss the history of, of how Satan tried to destroy Israel because Jesus Christ came. And Satan will t try to destroy Israel because they're God's chosen people. What, whatever God makes, Satan hates. So if you get messed up about Israel, you, you misunderstand so much of your Bible. And what you also miss is, is the promises and, and, and of God. And you miss out on God's great mercy and grace. You know, if it was me, Israel would no longer be a nation. I'd, I'd have given up on them. But God is, is such a wonderful God. And then the, the, the other thing, if you, if you get this wrong, you get a wrong world view. You, and uh, so it's so important. Now, the last few weeks we've been looking at Israel during the tribulation period. And uh, so let's turn back to the book of Revelation. And we saw how God works through the churches. And then, uh, starting in chapter 4, we do not see the churches anymore. We see Israel. And last week, we saw about the 144,000, and we're going to see them again. So, excuse me. So, Revelation 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount, on the mount Zion. And with him 144,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were the redeemed among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. Well, a, a, an awful lot in this chapter. Now this chapter is kind of like... Uh, say, almost opposite to the previous chapter. Revelation 13 uh, deals with uh, Satan and the beast, and, and, and uh, uh, but Revelation 14 now looks at something different. So I want to read you what Dr. Strauss here says. 
The new chapter unfolded the next object of the relativer's uh, uh, apocalyptic vision. Whereas he had seen the deception and destruction of the Antichrist, now the apostle viewed the triumph of Christ, the Lamb. Chapter 13 dealt with the man-beast and the destiny of his followers, while chapter 14 dealt with the God-man and the victory of his followers. The first beast will reign for the last three and a half years to, and come to an abrupt end. The Lord Jesus Christ will, will deliver the sealed 144,000 through the whole tribulation and into the beginning of the millennium. So <clears throat> chapter 14 goes to the end of the tribulation period. And uh, so we look at it. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. So he's looking into the future, and he sees a lamb. Now, obviously, we know who that lamb is, right? Who's the lamb? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Look at uh, Revelation 5. Capital L on the Lamb. That's the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 5, verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all them that are, all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. We see the Lamb being worshipped just a few verses earlier, verses 8 and 9. Uh, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take... To, to, to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So it's, it's very clear the Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lamb stood on Mount Zion. Now, understand, the real Mount Zion is heavenly uh, New Jerusalem. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 12 but there's a physical mount zion as well hebrews 12 verse 22 and 23 but ye are come unto mount zion and unto the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels and to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, and to the, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just may, men made perfect. So we here see, see there, there's a heavenly Jerusalem. So there's a, Jerus, a, 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 a Jerusalem in, 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 on the earth, and there's a Jerusalem in heaven, the new Jerusalem. Now, in the city of Jerusalem, there is Mount Zion. There's a physical uh, uh, let me uh, just read you one, another one on New Jerusalem. Uh, Psalm 125, verse 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abideth forever. <coughs> <coughs> That's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. But there is a physical Jerusalem. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, 4, verse 48. Well, I'm going to read that, and you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Deuteronomy 4.48, And from Aor, which is by the bank of the river of Ammon, even unto Mount Zion, which is Hermon. Now, 2 Samuel, chapter 5, and you can leave your finger in Revelation or something, because we'll be coming back there. 2 Samuel, <coughs> excuse me, 5. Verses 6 to 9. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I 
And the king and his men went to Jerusalem um, to the, the Jebus, his, <clears throat> the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking that David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. <clears throat> so, there is a heavenly Jerusalem, a heavenly Mount Zion, and there's an earthly Mount Zion. So which one is it? Well, I believe it's Jesus Christ coming to the earth at the end of the millennium. <clears throat> Look at Psalm chapter 2. Uh, Psalm 2 is, is talking about Jesus Christ as well. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. Those are the nations <clears throat> prophetically at the end of the tribulation period rejecting God. And so then, if we continue down, verse 6, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ask of me, and I will, shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance. Uh, and upon the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. At the end of the tribulation period, you could turn to Zechariah, if you would please, but at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus Christ will come back down to the earth and he will actually come down to the Mount of Olives and, uh, <clears throat> and he will destroy the nations that are against him. Uh, so Zechariah 14 <clears throat> And so uh, when we are seeing in Revelation 14, we are seeing at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus literally comes to earth. In Zechariah 14, verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And uh, it seems like these uh, will, will open up and, and, and give Israel protection to go through. But So let's go back to uh, Revelation. So we see Jesus coming in Revelation 14 to earth where the 144,000 are. So let's go back to Revelation 14. And I looked, and verse 1, And lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is very interesting. These are the same 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> And it's very clear in Revelation 7, where, where are these people from, these 144,000? What kind of people are they? Israelites. They're Israelites. They're Jews. 12,000 from every tribe. I think the tribe of Dan is uh, not mentioned there. And it's interesting, the British Israelites say... The Danes are, are, are from the tribe of Dan. <laughs> it's interesting in the book of Revelation, Dan's not even there. So it's just, uh, it's just amazing how people twist Scripture. But I want to show you something that's really interesting. Okay, so we go back to Revelation 7, and we see this is the same group of people. And it's interesting, they're even sealed the same, and every, it's, it's explained more. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so... In Revelation chapter 7, the angel uh, 
comes down and saying in verse 3, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servant of our God in their foreheads. And then, I'm not going to read every uh, verse, but we see verse 4, And I heard the number of them that were sealed, uh, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah, Judah were sealed 12,000. And it goes through the tribes, okay? And uh, everybody sees that. I don't have to read every tribe, right? Okay, so these are Jews. Now, they're sealed. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry about this. I'm, sometimes when I touch this, it just goes to some other page. It takes me a second to get back there. Now, I want you to see this. This is so important. Who are the 144,000? You tell me. What does the Bible say? From the 12 tribes. Here's a, here's a commentator, Tim LaHaye. Uh, the 144,000 in chapter 14 are probably the most outstanding 144,000 saints, saints of the church from the early days of the spread of the gospel unto the rapture of the church. You see, once... You, you say the church, Israel becomes the church, you just destroy the Bible. And, and people that do this have an ulterior motive. I mean, I think God made it pretty plain when he said 12,000 of this tribe, 12,000 of that tribe. Amen? Is it plain, not plain to you? It's plain to me. Take the Bible for what it says. Now, People twist the scripture to teach what they want to believe. Change what you believe to what the scripture says. Amen? We're all learning and, and, and learning more. But we're going to see this is the same group. So have your finger in Revelation 7 and then in Revelation 14. So... Verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servant of our God in their foreheads. Now, Revelation 14. And lo, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name, his father's name, written in their foreheads. So we, now we know what the seal is. It's the name of God in their foreheads. Same group, amen? Clear as day. In chapter 7, we're told they're sealed in their foreheads. Here we're told that the sealing in their foreheads was the name of God. Now, think about this. We Christians are sealed too. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Who's doing the sealing here in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14? Angels. Angels. Can this be Christians? Absolutely not. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Either you, you, you admit that you trust Scripture, or, or, or I, I, just, I just don't know how people can do this. Ephesians 1.13 In whom also I asked for that ye believed, ye are, uh, in whom also ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now we are sealed till when? Anybody know how long we're sealed till? Until the redemption of the body. Until the of the, body. the Holy Spirit dwells us in us until the rapture. These are sealed Till the end of the tribulation period, uh, and uh, so there, there, there's such such a difference uh, uh, of, of the ceiling. And, and uh, in Revelation 22, 4, four it says, "And I showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river." where there is a tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. 
and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations and they shall be no more cursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name written in their foreheads. So it's a visible sealing with God's name written in their foreheads. We have a visible written sealing of God's name in their foreheads done by angels. Physical, visible. We have spiritual, invisible. Can you look at so someone and say, oh, I, I could see the name of God written on their forehead. You can't do it, can you? They're not Christians. God says they're, well, they are Christians in the sense they're Jewish Christians. But they're not church age saints. And they're nothing to do with the church. Now, in verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. He hears the voice. Now, it's one voice. Is it hearing? I'm not sure. Does he hear this and then this and then this? Or does he hear all three at the same time? But he says he hears the voice. Uh, he, he's not saying he heard many waters. He's not saying he heard great thunder. He's not saying he heard harpers harping. He's heard and I as the voice of many waters. As. What, what type of uh, thing is that in English language? It's a simile. A simile is kind of easy to understand. It's something that's kind of similar. The actual definition is it's a figure of speech involving comparison of one thing with another thing of a different kind. Used to make the description more emphatic or vivid. So, God has given us this sound. Uh, now, voice equals sound, okay? It's not like it's speaking. Uh, it's, it's talking about the sound, right? You get that? Like the voice of birds? The birds aren't actually singing. It's, it's, this is a simile to help us to understand. Now, if I think of the voice of many waters, I can think of two particular things. We've been to Niagara Falls. I don't know. Do you remember the, the boat at the bottom of the uh, falls? Do you remember? It was loud, wasn't it? I mean, if, you, if you're at the bottom of that falls, there's the roaring of that water. And the other thing I could think of is waves hitting the, the in a storm smashing against the beach. So that's the voice. And then the voice of a great thunder. Uh, I remember my brother asking my wife, do we have many thunderstorms in Ireland? She thought, yeah, we had, we're pretty good. But when, when you get, uh, we, we were uh, passing through Columbus, Ohio. Do you remember that? I mean, the thunder. It, 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 my brothers, they, they, they did all kinds of stuff. But they were in, um, we lived in a place called Sioux Lookout. It's uh, where the Ojibwe would look out for the Sioux that we're attacking. And there was a mountain called Sioux Mountain. Well, they were on Sioux Mountain in a lightning storm. And the lightning hit about 20 feet away. I mean, could you imagine the thunder and the crash? I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've ever had been this close to thunder where it actually you could feel it shake your body. But it's real. And, and this is it's not the voice of many waters, and it's not the voice, it's as the voice. And then he heard the third thing, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Oh, sorry, that, that is harpers harping with the harps. The first two are as. Now, these harpers harping with their harps go back to Revelation chapter 7. I believe 
These are the people that got saved in the tribulation period. Okay, I'm looking for the verse and I didn't write it down here. Maybe I have it here in my notes further along. Oh, verses 9 and 10. Revelation, verses 9 and 10. So we, we saw the sealing of the 144,000. Verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and psalms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, uh, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and the elders and the four beasts fell down before the throne on their faces, worshipped and worshipped God. Now, go back to uh, Revelation 14. And we see these uh, elders uh, and the song and the harpers, and, and they're singing a song. So verse four, uh, 2, And I heard the voice of a voice from heaven. So uh, this voice is in heaven, but Jesus is on the earth. And so uh, you, at this time you'll be able to hear what's happening in heaven on earth. And I heard the voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of the harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And, to no, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So uh, we've got this uh, song that they're singing. And uh, it's a new song. And uh, this 144,000 is, 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 are, are um, they're being serenaded almost because they are going to, I'll explain this, uh, they, they're the only ones that can know this song. And so let me read you two uh, quotes here. The song is that of the victory after the conflict with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Never sung before, for such a conflict had never been fought before. Therefore, knew, till now the kingdom of Christ on earth had been usurped. They sing the song in anticipation of his blood-brought kingdom with his saints. Now I'll read you a constable here. The song, uh, the song this group sang in heaven is one that only the 144,000 of all God's creatures could learn. Now, what do they mean by could learn? This is, it, it, let me explain it. Probably they the only ones that could learn it in the sense that they were the only ones that it could appreciate what it expressed. God had purchased them from earth for their special ministry in the Great Tribulation, not just for salvation. I can sing Amazing Grace and I can actually know what it means that God saved, what it, that God saved a wretch like me. Now, I can relate to that because I was a wicked young man when I got saved. I could learn that song. But Priscilla got saved as a young child and she never got into that sin. So she could never really understand that in the same way that I could understand that. You, you, you follow me? And in the same way, uh, th this is learned by discipleship. Uh, I'm going to look at two quick verses real quick. Uh, Ephesians 4 verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. It's, 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 it's talking about learning and fellowship. In, 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 uh, sorry, in discipleship. And then uh, Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. Twenty-eight and twenty-nine. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. So this learning um, is the idea of the, that that they have gone through this, 
and they've learned what this song is talking about. And, and that's uh, the wonderful thing. Now, uh, let me uh, read you Strauss here. The 144,000 are the only ones who will be able to learn the song because it will relate to their experience as sealed Jewish evangelists with their specific ministry who have lived through the horrors of the tribulation. Now, this is another key thing. This cannot be uh, church age saints. Let's go back to Revelation 14. Verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women. How could this be all the great, greatest saints uh, since the, from the start of the church to the rapture, uh, or I forget what he said, uh, till the millennium? Because these are all men. I, I reckon there's just as many great women than men, Christians. Amen? Ladies? Yes, of course. But these are men. They were just chosen men. Uh, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the 144,000 greatest Christians were virgins? I think uh, there's a good chance a lot of them were married. Amen? Of course. Uh, these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now this is very key, understand. These are the first fruits of the Lamb. Does that mean they're the first Christians? You see, it can't be Christians because these are the first fruits. What does it mean, the first fruits? Well, you understand what the first fruits are. You, you, you have a harvest, but at the very start, they would take some of the first bit of harvest and offer it to God. And it was the first fruits. And... These are the first fruits of the saints in the tribulation period, right? It's, it's real plain, isn't it? It can't be Christians, church-age Christians. Because, I'll just give you a couple of verses here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Uh, but every man in his order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards theirs are Christ as his coming. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 15. That's talking about the, the resurrection. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and they that have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So the, uh, the house of Stephanus were the first people saved in that area. That's real easy, isn't it? Look at uh, just another verse. Romans 16, verse uh, 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epaphitanus, who is the firstfruits of of Achaia unto Christ. So here's the person that got saved, the first fruits. Well, these people, the first fruits in the different places where they got saved. In Revelation 100, uh, uh, 14 and Revelation 7, the 144,000 are the first fruits of people saved when? The, at the start of the tribulation. The rapture? The 144,000 are saved and sealed, and they go out and evangelize. And uh, if you remember Revelation 7, we saw that there was a great multitude saved. But the people that they evangelize literally give their life for God. But the 144,000 aren't ever killed because they are sealed and protected all the way through the tribulation period, and, and they continue to witness and win people for Christ. Uh, the, why are they virgins? Well, understand that the rapture, all Christians are taken to heaven. So the people that are left are, are generally not very nice people. So they, these young men get saved. Now, it doesn't say young men, so I'm, I'm, but I'm assuming they are younger. Uh, 
there's really nobody for them to marry. I mean, they get saved at the start of the tribulation, right? There's no Christians. So there's no one for them to marry. And the other thing is, in consideration of, of the time, would you really want to be married to, to uh, somebody? Because they're the only 140, the 144,000 are the only ones that are guaranteed never to, to be martyred. Would you like to, to be married to somebody knowing that they're going to have to maybe a, a, a week, a month later be, die for the, you know, just, it's not really, and, and the, 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 literally the logistics of it would, would hold them back. Paul said in, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, 25 and 26, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that obtaineth mercy from the, of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good. At the present distress, I say that it is good for a man to be so. Paul said, under the inspiration of God, there, there was a, they were in a certain distress, and during that distress, it was better that they weren't married. The very same thing with these uh, evangelists. Uh, they're, they're giving themselves to the work of the Lord, and it's a difficult time. But they're followers of Christ. Um, uh, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto the God and to the Lamb. They're definitely followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? They're followers of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Uh, they're Jewish evangelists that got saved at the beginning of, of the tribulation period. There's no guile in their mouth. Um, and, and, and there's such a contrast between that and what's happening in the world. You, uh, during the tribulation period, you have the satanic deception, lies all around the world, but you have these people. Uh, it's really, for me, quite exciting to see what God is doing and what God will do. And if you just read your Bible and study it, you will never, ever could you say that these are Christians. It's just, it's well, they are Christians. I should say church-age Christians. They are Christians. They're Jewish Christians. Uh, but they're certainly not 144,000 of, of, of the most godly people. Uh, but it's interesting how God will protect them. And and. You see at the start, in Revelation 7, is the start of the uh, tribulation period. How many were, were sealed? Anybody? How many of these evangelists were sealed? 144,000. We come to the end of the tribulation period, and how many are there? Verse 14, chapter 14, verse 1, and lo... I looked, and lo, a lamb, of the, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Everyone that was sealed was still there. Amen? God did it. I am sealed of the day of redemption, and God's going to keep it. Amen? It's exciting to see, and, 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 and it's there for us if we just look at it. And uh, they're without fault before the throne. I just praise God for his wonderful mercy and protection upon Israel. I thank God that he's going to see these, uh, these uh, evangelists through, and he's going to see me through. And it's just wonderful. And, and modern-day Israel it, it, it is really a miracle of God. I just want to read you another story about in 1973, while the entire country of Israel fasted for Yom Kippur. What, what's feast that? That's the Day of Atonement. Okay. 100,000 Egyptians invaded Israel from the south, and over 1,400 Syrian tanks invaded Israel from the north. They're invaded from the south, and they're invaded from the north, and they had no idea that it was going to happen. And the whole country was, was celebrating this day. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't ready. They had no idea this was going to be attacked. And uh, let me read. With a significant portion of the Israeli military either in their homes or synagogues, Israel was nearly defensive. Not only was Israel caught off guard, com completely caught off guard and outnumbered, now the vast majority of our soldiers were at their weakest. 
Satan knew exactly when to attack. But you know, it's amazing. You know, the Jews, most of them, do not acknowledge that God protected them. But God did. And let me read you this. Initially, Syria... Um, Syria, initially Syria was gaining territory and logic dictates that Israel should have lost this war. But by the end of the Yom Kippur War, Israel somehow managed to come up on top with her weakened troops and managed to reach 20 kilometers into Syria. And then Israel was forced to uh, make a peace treaty. Just amazing. God is literally fulfilling prophecy before us. And the, just this recent attack um, uh, on Israel and all the uh, uh, rockets raining down, and, and I was reading how the, the uh, rebels in, in Yemen wanted to send their support, and every and Israel is just being surrounded by nations that want to destroy it. And you know what's going to happen? The Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel and, and guarantee it its protection. Things are coming to a close very soon. What, do, what does it mean to me? It means this. I need to be busy trying to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to be faithful. Uh, I realize that uh, uh, as we looked in, in, in uh, 2 Timothy 3, perilous times shall come. It's not going to be easy for Christians. But the same God that we saw in, in Revelation 7 seal the servants and he kept them till the end of the tribulation period, the whole 144,000. The same God is still on the throne. Amen? So let me encourage you. God is in control but let's keep busy serving him. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your precious word. Uh, pray, Lord, as uh, we've studied this, that I pray that it would be plain and uh, that people would understand. And Lord, we thank you how, how that you said if we could uh, rightly divide the word of truth, that we could just see what you're doing. And I thank you that you have kept your promises and you will continue to keep your promises. And we can look at the history of Israel and see you kept your promises. We can look at the future of Israel and see you kept your promises. And we can look at the promises you've made in the Bible for us. And you will always keep them. And I thank you that, for that. Lord, help us to rejoice in what a great God you are. And we ask in Jesus Christ's name, amen.